All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. If you could take your seats. Uh, we'll let some people trickle in. Uh, so um, Alex Elaine and Andrew Tywin, Tymon, sorry, pardon me, are up next from Dropbox. And without further ado, I'll bring Alex up here. Then we're going to talk about cross-platform development on mobile. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Lane. I'm an engineer at Dropbox on our cross-platform uh, C++ development team. And uh, Andrew is also on the same team. And we'll be talking about using C++ uh, to build your app once instead of twice. Uh, so the goal for this talk is actually to arm you guys to go out and start making uh, cross-platform C++ apps. So we'll show you some code. We'll talk about some of one of the tools we've built. and hopefully give you some insight into how to do things a little bit more efficiently. So for context, our situation uh, at Dropbox, we have two apps that have been written uh, cross-platform using C++, Carousel, which is a Dropbox connected uh, photo gallery that uh, can scale to tens of thousands of your photos with native performance and look and feel, and Mailbox, which is a, a rethinking of how people uh, use email. Uh, both of these are available both on iOS and Android. Uh, sharing the same C++ core. Um, so let me give you a little bit more context on our situation uh, if you're thinking, should I take this approach or not? So for us, performance and uh, memory uh, matter a great deal. For Carousel, for example, we found that uh, if we had uh, tens of thousands of photos, and when, when we were running into a lot of GC pauses on Android, and uh, by moving a lot of the logic for handling photo scrolling into C++, we're able to take tight control over the, C++, uh, over the memory uh, allocations and more importantly, the deallocations. We no longer suffered from half second uh, GC pauses while people were scrolling through. Um, we also have a lot of complex logic on the client. You've been hearing about this from folks like Brett Taylor earlier, but we have to work offline. You don't want to just have your photos when you're uh, connected to the internet. And we obviously have a lot of syncing logic. And of course, we want to be on all platforms. So there are a couple of approaches you could consider taking. Uh, so one is build everything native. Uh, we've done that. Uh, so we have our Dropbox core app. It's the file system view that you have on your phone that uh, shows you all, all your files in Dropbox. That's written once for iOS and once for Android. Um, you know, at the time, there weren't clear alternatives. The downside of this is that you have a lot of code that you've done twice. And it's a lot of the same kind of code. It's the same logic across platforms. Uh, you end up with a lot of the same bugs because your domain that you're, you're working in is the same and the code is just different. At the same time, if you want things to be consistent, you have to have a ton of overhead with communication between people on the team. Like, oh, this is how I did this thing. This is how I did that thing. But you always forget to mention the edge case you solved the night before at 2 AM. And so you end up with a lot of both consist inconsistencies at, at all layers. And that bubbles down even to the um, design itself, so you're going to have different ways that people write uh, the code in uh, iOS and Android. And that means if somebody else comes in and they're willing to dive into two code bases, uh, not only do they have to work across two languages, but they also have to work across two architectures. A uh, concrete example of where this really bit us was uh, when we shipped the camera uploads feature a couple of years back. Uh, it syncs all of your photos that you've taken on your phone up to Dropbox. Uh, that shipped actually four months apart um, between iOS and Android. So, the other approach uh, that seems very natural is build everything entirely cross-platform. We've done that too. Um, Dropbox has the Dropbox desktop client. It's written primarily in Python, uh, which works really well, actually. All of this very complicated sort of secret sauce syncing logic that makes Dropbox feel magical, and your magic folders on both computers are automatically synced. Uh, we only had to write that once. I can't even imagine writing that multiple times across different platforms. It would have been a real mess. Um, so, we also thought, hey, why don't we take the uh, UI and try making that cross-platform as well? So we built um, what you see here is the desktop notification uh, UI. It shows the changed files in your Dropbox, other updates, status. And we built that using uh, WebKit. And we launched this app, this uh, feature. We wrote it once across all platforms. And users hated it. Turns out people like things to look the same way as everything else on their computer. Um, shocking. So we actually ended up uh, doing a lot more work to rewrite this, uh, still in WebKit, but to make it look closer to native. Uh, so the code that we wanted to write once, uh, we actually got to write twice um, for both platforms. Uh, and then the final approach, and this is the one we've taken in Carousel and Mailbox, is make your native U your, your UI uh, in uh, the native platform code, and then use a C++ cross-platform core. 
And uh, we'll talk a lot more about that. But you can see here, Carousel uh, has a very smooth scroll, um, even with uh, you know, many, many photos. And you know, that's uh, basically what the app looks like. So let's talk about C++. I know you're probably all thinking, this is great. I've, uh, I'm very happy to write things once, but do I have to write in C++? It's a quick poll. How many people in the audience have written professional C++? How many of you have, are familiar with C++ 11 and 14? Oh, excellent. Well, let's do a little tour of a few nice things about C++. So C++ has gotten a heck of a lot better since uh, probably you worked with it in the past, or maybe you learned it in school. Um, the tools are a lot better. This is actually really important. So now you have things like Clang built on top of LLVM. You get um, much, better, uh, much better error messages. You get compile as you type in Xcode. Uh, you have tools like Clang Tidy and Clang Format, which will automatically uh, update your code to uh, best practices or your current style, uh, similar to something like Go Format. So a lot of the pain of app development uh, goes away from that. The standard libraries are better. You have regular expressions, multi-platform uh, multi concurrency, and um, hash maps all sort of baked in. And the, the heart of it, the thing that I think is most compelling for a lot of people, is the language itself they really took a, a lot of time to think about how do we make this programmer friendly. So let's look at just a couple of examples. So this is C++ 98. Um, sorry to subject you to this horrible boilerplate. We have a vector of uh, integers. We have a bunch of boilerplate just to put five elements into it. Then this god-awful template gobbledygook just to iterate over it. Don't worry. It doesn't really matter if you understand this or not. because This is not the future. Um, and we have some pointer syntax because we, don't, we need pointers too. Why not? C++. This is the same code written in modern C++. So uniform initialization syntax allows you to specify, ah, I want a vector with five elements. Here they are. We have range for loops. What this is doing is saying, uh, take each element of the sequence, assign it to this variable i, and then print it. This is pretty close to Python, actually. Uh, this is tolerable code. It's not bad at all. Uh, we are taking advantage of another nice feature, auto, in C++11, which allows us to do type deduction, which also saves a great deal of uh, pain. Um, let's look at another example. So C++, you probably think, oh, yes, memory management. I love memory management. Um, <laughs> right? Like It's super fun to remember where to put your deletes everywhere. And if you have a, an exception that gets thrown inside of this kind of code, or you have an early return, you get to put more deletes in. It's almost like, where's Waldo? Um, C++11 um, fixes this for you by making uh, shared pointers part of the standard. So a shared pointer is a reference counted smart pointer. It works just like a pointer, except that it counts references. So when you release the last reference, it disappears. Think of it like ARC. Um, and you have make shared, which is a nice convenient function to create it. You give it the type and the constructor parameters. And again, notice we're using auto to make this uh, non boilerplate -y. So now if something happens in the middle of all of your logic, the references are automatically tracked for you. Very simple. Um, if you squint, you can almost treat this like you're working with a garbage collector, almost like Java, um, for example. So there are pluses and minuses. You can write better C++, but it's a lot less painful. Um, one other thing uh, that I don't have a slide on, I just want to call out C++11 also introduced Lambda functions, a very nice, concise syntax for it. So you get a lot of the goodness from modern languages, uh, and things are, are really quite a bit better. Um, so now that I hope I've convinced you that C++ is less painful, how do we actually go and use the language? So we have basically a three-tier uh, architecture. We have the UI, which is written in the platform-specific native code, Java or Objective-C. We have a language bridge. This is uh, basically where you put all of the marshalling and unmarshalling of data across your boundary. Uh, that's J and I, uh, which is you know, obviously not so much fun to write, or Objective-C++. And then you have your actual app logic, which lives in the, that cross-platform C++ layer. So a couple of uh, principles about this code. So you want to keep your UI layer super thin. That's the code you're writing twice. Writing things twice is bad. Uh, hopefully we all agree. So keep that thin. But it does allow you to have the native look and feel. The language bridge you also want to keep really thin. Um, I imagine that uh, writing JNI is not what most people are excited about doing, writing Objective-C++. 
can work, um, but uh, many developers prefer to work in straight Objective-C. Uh, Andrew will also actually be talking shortly about some tooling that we've, we've built that helps with this. Um, and uh, let's expand this out just a little bit further. So we'll talk about a couple more of these things. So all the things in bold will be areas that we'll kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive into later. Um, one thing I do want to mention on this slide, we found that, so we follow a, a model view model, a model view model view architecture. And we've actually found that we've been able to pull the view model logic into C++, which means that a lot of the, uh, a lot of that logic we can avoid duplicating as well. That does mean some platform specific pieces make it into the C++ layer. That's okay. The goal is not to have like an entirely agnostic C++ layer. It's to avoid duplication and have a clean boundary um, when possible. Um, so, and then you have your app logic, and of course, any libraries you want. We'll talk about networking, threading. Uh, for storage and caching, we, haven't, we don't have too much to say that's super fancy. We found SQLite to work pretty well, for example. And uh, the last one here that we'll talk about is actually specialized platform features. So things like uh, GPS or you know, background fetch, wake locks. And so you want that. What does that mean? There is a small tweak we need to make to our architecture. So now, in addition to our uh, UI, we also have our platform services. Platform services are basically the things that uh, you access through your, your native code frameworks. And so we provide uh, to the app logic layer a set of callbacks that are then available and giving access to the platform specific features uh, within C++. Um, this works really well for us. So at this point, I'd like to hand it off to Andrew to talk more about how we take advantage of this architecture. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm Andrew. Uh, I've been working on our uh, cross-platform mobile code base since its inception a couple of years ago. Originally, it was part of our uh, SDKs when we wanted to take some of that syncing logic, make it available to third-party developers building on our platform. But in building that, we ended up uh, spearheading a kind of new way of doing things. And then we had new apps come along like Carousel and Mailbox uh, and found that they can benefit from this as well. Uh, what I want to do is tell you a little bit more about what we learned along the way and um, do a bit of a deep dive into some of the things that, uh, that, that we think were tricky as we did so. Um, starting with some of those platform services that Alex uh, mentioned, and the two specific examples I'm going to talk about are how we do networking and how we do threading. Um, so we, had, we faced a choice, which is at what layer of that architecture that Alex explained should we handle network I.O.? Um, and there are two obviously cho obvious choices here. One is use the frameworks that come with the platform. Um, they have pretty strong ones. Um, or do we use portable C++ libraries and keep things, everything inside of that lower library layer? Um, and we are actually have made different choices in different apps, um, which is a good demonstration of the fact that this architecture is not prescriptive. You can choose whatever makes the most sense for you. Um, so let's talk uh, first about um, the way of doing this. Actually, these slides got reordered, so I'm going to jump back and forth. Um, let's talk first about doing it in C++. Um, there are a lot of good portable libraries available for doing networking stuff. Obviously, it's something you want on every platform. Um, there are benefits here. Um, the, you get consistent features and consistent bugs across all platforms. You get high performance because you're doing everything down in your C++ layers. There's no marshalling. There's no bridging between languages. Um, the flip side of this, though, is that it's up to you to get all the details right. Um, you're responsible for shipping a new version of OpenSSL if there's a bug. Um, which there sometimes is, as you probably know. Um, and this was something that some apps want to do, some, some don't. Um, so this is a, an example of an approach that was taken by uh, Mailbox for talking to their email backend. Um, they have high, high performance concerns, and they aren't using HTTP. They're actually just using a direct WebSocket protocol. Um, so this was a good fit for them, let them control everything in their stack and have high performance. Um, the other approach uh, is to use the frameworks that are on the language. That are the, sorry on the platform. Um, uh, the major mobile platforms, as you know, uh, have pretty strong networking libraries. They do a lot of things for you. Um, you get a lot of features for free. Uh, you know, if you want connection reuse, if you need to deal with uh, HTTP proxies, um, and they also have specialized uh, features that are very specific to the language. Um, for instance, on iOS, you've got background fetch helps you do more things uh, when your app isn't on screen. Um, also, on every platform, you need some way of detecting what the network state is. Are you online? Are you offline? We respond to that in our syncing logic. Um, another important uh, aspect of this is that you get feature parity and also security parity with 
every other app on the platform. Um, this was particularly important to us when building out SDKs that we didn't want to have a new set of security bugs that we could in introduce to somebody else's app just because they wanted to sync to Dropbox. Um, we thought it was important that they know about whatever security situation they're in on that platform and respond to it in the way that they would normally want to and we'll have the same behavior as them. Um, Another benefit is you don't have to update things yourself because you're just using what's already on the platform. Um, however, there is a flip side to this, which is that you're subject to the vagaries of whatever is on the platform and you gotta live with that. Uh, and in particularly in the Android world, that means that you've got many different versions of the HTTP libraries that you gotta run on top of. Um, that can sometimes be a problem. Um, it was pretty much okay for our SDKs, we had to live with it. Um, in Carousel, as an example, though, they actually, on Android, ship their own jar with a different version of the, of the Java HTTP libraries just to keep a consistent version. Um, it's okay HTTP, it's the same thing that is used in KitKat uh, on Android, but we, we can use it on older versions. But as you, uh, as you notice, they're still replacing things at the platform-specific layer rather than at the C++ layer. Um, so if you wanna take that particular approach, how do we do it? Um, we use the platform service architecture that uh, Alex mentioned. Um, what that means is C++ code can call into a class called HTTP requester. Um, this is something that isn't generic at HTTP, it's actually specialized to our Dropbox APIs and knows how to do authentication to Dropbox, knows how we encode parameters and returns, which is a pretty uh, standard uh, REST API. Um, it provides a synchronous interface because um, we only use it on background threads, which will just wait for the response and then process it. Um, and it, when it, when the HTTP requester class needs to do the actual raw communication, it uses an abstract interface that is implemented by the platform code, um, wh whether in Java or Objective C. Um, and that pl platform code translates any differences in the model. For instance, um, the native model for HTTP in Java is synchronous. Um, but the, the natural model in Objective-C or in the Apple frameworks is asynchronous. Um, so the platform code glues things together and, and gives a, a consistent model to the C++ code so it doesn't have to worry about that difference. Okay, I wanna talk in, sl slightly more briefly about uh, another platform service uh, that we made use of which is for background threads. Obviously, we do syncing. Um, you don't wanna wait for the network. So we have background threads that handle the sync for you. That's how uh, Dropbox uh, feels magical. Uh, you operate locally and it eventually syncs to the server. Uh, but how do we manage this? Um, we want our C++ code to be able to freely manage these threads, decide how many threads it needs, how to communicate with them. Um, however, it turns out some of the frameworks that we're dealing with uh, don't like threads that they didn't create uh, calling into the framework. Um, for instance, in Java, there is technically a way to attach uh, JNI state to a, to a thread that you created yourself, but we've experienced problems with class loaders not getting properly attached, so if you use a class that wasn't already loaded, things can go wrong. Um, in Python, which we don't use in production apps, what we do use in testing internally, um, there are issues with thread local storage, that every time a, a non-Python created thread goes into Python, it gets a brand new thread local slot, um, which is not usually how you want thread locals to work. Um, so, and in general, on every platform, you get slightly inconsistent debugging in terms of like, can you, alloc can you specify the name of a thread and will you see it in your debugger or things like that. Um, Objective-C doesn't actually have any other problems that we've run into because it's built on C, but um, so we like to let the, the frameworks uh, create the threads, but we still want C++ to be in charge of managing them. The way we do that, um, we have another platform service, which is provided by the platform code for thread creation. Um, C++ will call that, provide a name and a priority for the thread, and then also provide a uh, function object which captures a lambda, which is what to run in the thread. Um, one advantage of the lambda closures in C++11 uh, is that it can capture resources as well. So you can, using one of those shared pointers that Alex mentioned, we can make sure that whatever objects are needed by that thread are kept alive until it starts, just in case someone calls shutdown before your thread is even started. You don't have any race conditions that could lead to use ever after free. Um, and then after creation, C++ is in charge of the thread. It does whatever communication it wants to do. Um, in our case, we use mutexes and conditions, pretty low level stuff, um, though we're working on higher level uh, asynchronous models for more app developers. All right, so that hopefully gave you an example of some of the problems that we've tackled and hopefully arms you to tackle them yourselves. If you didn't know about that class loader issue and you're planning on diving into JNI, um, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, now I wanna dive a little bit into the bridging between languages that we do. 
how we do this, what it looks like, what the, the basic concerns are. Um, and then I'll uh, move into introducing the tool, which if you guys use it yourselves, might save you from ever having to think about this. But it's good to know what you're building on top of. Uh, I'm going to start with bridging to Java and do another quick poll of the audience. How many of you have written production Java code? OK, quite a few. How many of you have written production JNI code? Very few. Um, how many of you enjoyed writing production JNI code? <laughs> I don't think I see any hands. Um, so JNI is the Java native interface. Those of you who have experienced it knows that it's kind of ugly. Um, it was really designed for small, isolated bits of native code that you might want to run uh, if you had you know, scientific computations that you wanted to run at very low level, or you had to access some specialized hardware with a driver. That was the kind of thing that JNI was originally designed for. Um, obviously, the implementers of the VM itself and of the APIs make heavier use of it. Um, so there are lots of folks at Google who, who use this a lot. Um, however, uh, it isn't really the kind of thing that everyone wants to use. Um, oh, and as an aside, everything I'm going to say about JNI applies to Java and other platforms, not just Android, um, in case uh, that ever becomes useful to you. Let me show you a little bit about what uh, JNI looks like. Um, so here's what you would see in your Java code uh, on the Java side of the, of the boundary. Uh, two things. One is that somebody has to actually load up the library that contains all of your native code. Um, and I'm sorry, the word native is a bit overloaded here. Um, JNI uses native to mean the C++ code, whereas uh, mobile developers are used to using native, meaning Java or Objective-C on whatever platform. Um, so the library needs to be loaded at some point. The static block will make sure that uh, it gets loaded when this class is. And then this native keyword on this method says to Java, I'm not going to give you an implementation in Java code. Instead, you should go look for it uh, in some native library. Uh, and it's looking it up by symbol. So here's what the other side of that would look, look like. This is uh, C++ code, though very C-like. Um, so I've got all these decorations on the function that allow it to be the kind of function that JNI can find. Um, JNI finds it by this name. This is a magical symbol that it looks for based on the Java class and the method name. There are ways to register manually if you really want to do this, but uh, we find that this is the easiest. Uh, and every JNI function gets given this JNI env. Uh, which is an object through which you can interact with the Java VM. Um, in this case, this is a static method, so you also get a pointer to the class. Um, notice this wonderful word, class, um, which is how they avoid uh, conflicting with keywords in C++. Um, and then you also, in this case, get an int. It's passed as a jint, which is an uh, integer type that's guaranteed to be the same size as a Java integer, um, which is also th always 32 bits. Uh, and then once you've gotten past all that, things look pretty simple so far because uh, you just call this static function on your C++ class, pass the argument, return the int, and it happens that ints and jints are, rough, are uh, castable, so there's not going to be any serious problem here. So let's get into a slightly less simple example. Um, what if I want to call an instance method rather than a static method? Um, so what changes in the declaration is now I've got an object viz uh, instead of a class. Um, and I, the problem I'm faced with is I need to get a C++ object to call this on from somewhere. Um, a typical way of doing that is you actually have the Java object hold on to the C++ object. It can't do that directly, unfortunately. So the way you do, do that is you actually take a void star and you cast it to a long, have Java hold on to that and give it back to you. Um, here's how you might do that. So uh, first you have to get the class of the object that you're being called on so that you can ask that class for a method called getCVP, which is a method I would have implemented. Um, it takes no arguments and returns a long. J stands for long. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, and then you can finally call this method saying, call a long method, meaning a method returning a long, give it this object, give it this method ID, and pass this argument. Um, and I actually noticed this before the, before the talk, but decided to leave it there because it's instructive. I wasn't supposed to pass that argument. Um, but J and I didn't complain. This ran just fine um, because this is calling a, a C function. Extra arguments on the stack just get ignored. Um, so in this case, I was lucky. Good thing I didn't leave off an argument rather than passing an extra one. Um, anyway, if you get this long back from Java, you can uh, reinterpret cast it, and that's the verbose way in C++ of saying I'm doing a really scary thing. Um, and then finally, you can make your call and you re return your int. So that's kind of annoying, um, particularly for something as simple as making a method call. Um, 
let's see how things get if I want to do some, something with a string instead of an int. Um, and I'm going to try and go a little bit faster. I think I'm taking too much time. Uh, so you can ask Java for some characters. This gives you back a const char star, which is what you might be used to from, from C. That seems pretty simple. I can pass that to a standard string, um, which is the C++ type that holds strings. Um, but then I got to manually release those characters that I just got back from Java because JNI is very C-like. Um, and then I got to translate the string back using these functions. So kind of annoying, but not too bad. Um, does anyone who has done JNI know why this is wrong? Uh, that's true, though I think get string UTF charge is something that just crashes if it fails. Um, <laughs> uh, I tested that. Um, there, <laughs> other calls in Java can in fact fail and throw exceptions, and I uh, um, uh, will not show sample code for that, but we'll talk a bit about it. Um, there's actually a more subtle problem, which we ran into when we implemented the data store API, where we wanted to let people store arbitrary strings, Unicode, anything like that in a data store. Um, see this UTF? That doesn't stand for UTF-8. Um, it stands for modified UTF-8, which is a uh, JNI convention that Java uses uh, for some reason I can't fathom, uh, which is mostly like UTF-8 until you get to some of the higher Unicode values. Um, and that's not good enough for us. We'd like to actually work for any string. Um, there's also another problem, which is since I'm using C strings here, I can't pass through a null character inside of my string. Um, most people don't care, but in the data store API, we wanted to make sure that people could put arbitrary data, truly arbitrary, so we cared about that. Um, so here's what it would look like if you want to deal with those problems. Um, so first of all, I'm asking for the string length, which gets me around the null character problem. Um, and also, then I'm going to ask the, for the string's chars in a 16-bit character type, uh, which is what Java stores internally. And I'm going to do this conversion myself using a little library that we've got in uh, C++. Um, you could also ask Java to do the conversion, um, but that would be even more complicated calls into Java. Um, so you can see here, I'm this is the last piece of uh, code I'm going to show you in JNI. You can see all I've done so far is pass a string and get back a string from a member function, and this has gotten pretty complicated. I haven't talked about how I would pass a list or a map or pass a listener interface that C++ needs to call back into Java. Um, I haven't talked about how you ex handle exceptions from Java. Um, which go into a nice thread local state that you have to explicitly check for um, when you're in C++ or everything will start failing. Um, I haven't talked about how you would catch a C++ exception and propagate that into Java, um, and how you maintain references into a Java object that will live beyond the boundary of your, of your method. Um, all of those are details that you'd have to get into if you want to write JNI code. They're pretty well documented, but messy and annoying. Um, but what's my point? My point is that JNI is tedious and error prone. Um, you got to do all the error checks yourself. You got to do all the resource management yourself. Um, and there's no type safety. I find this quite confounding, given that C++ and Java are two statically typed languages. I kind of like that aspect of them. But this bridge between them is entirely untyped. Um, you've got magic function names and reflection and unknown numbers of arguments, which hopefully you get right. Um, so there are ways of making the code simpler than what I showed you. You can use helper functions. You can use macros. Um, you can use C++ tricks to automatically free your resources. Um, but still, it gets pretty messy. I know I wrote the ver first version of the JNI interface uh, for the Sync SDK. Um, so I find myself, after I did that, really wishing I never had to do it again. Um, and we had more apps coming along that really wanted to use be built in Java, so they needed to do some of this. Um, now, if only there was a magical entity who would, could make me never have to do, have to do that again. Um, turns out there is. His name is Genie. Um, and he lets me write this instead. Um, this is a description of that interface uh, that I mentioned before. Um, says that it takes a string, returns a string. Uh, this is the, uh, and uh, that plus C is a little annotation that says I'm going to implement it in C++. Um, before I dive into exactly what that looks like, let me do a really quick coverage of the Objective-C side of this. Um, so if you want to bridge to Objective-C, which is the quote unquote native language on iOS and OS X, uh, you can go through Objective-C++. Um, uh, you heard from Facebook that they're using that. Um, we use it as well. It's pretty cool. Um, it's a little bit scary too, though, because it's sort of an unofficial overlay of, of these two languages. Apple and the you know, Clang and LLVM implementers know about it, um, but there is no you know, ISO standard Objective-C++. Um, so that gave us pause at first, but once we tried it out, we found it was pretty powerful. Um, if you've never experienced this before, imagine you take Objective-C, take the diffs between C and Objective-C, 
and rebase those onto C++, <laughs> uh, you get objective C++. Um, since they mostly use distinct syntax for things like methods calls, that actually works. Um, it's really powerful. Um, you don't have to write that much code because you can directly compose things. You know, you can have an Objective C object that owns a C++ object and construct, uh, creates it and destroys it directly. Um, and you can use all your favorite techniques from either language. You heard about how Facebook is doing that. Um, the, uh, the flip side of this is that it does get a little bit complicated. And I'm going to show you a little bit of how, la how that looks. Um, so here's a interface. This is plain old Objective-C um, that might be exposing something out of the uh, C++ library. Um, here's what a method implementation would look like. Uh, in this case, there's a whole lot less boilerplate than there is in JNI, so I jumped straight to an instance method. I didn't start with a static method. Um, the logic really is this underscore CPP object. Um, that's just an IVAR. If you've done Objective-C, you know what that is, just a you know, member variable inside of your, your Objective-C class. And it will automatically call the constructor and the destructor for you, and you can just directly make these calls. Pretty simple. Um, I'll show you the same examples that I did in Java. So here's how you would pass a string. Um, anyone think there's a bug with this now, like there was in Java? So there's no modified UTF-8 to, to deal with. Um, there are still embedded nulls to deal with, so the code isn't quite this simple. Um, I do have to pass an explicit length. But what I'm doing here is still pretty simple, and I'm letting NS string do all the encoding and de decoding. I don't have to use my own library to do that. So things st stay a lot simpler uh, than they were in JNI. Um, so what's my point? Um, this is easier than JNI. You can overlap your code. Um, they have a compatible men memory model, so you can sometimes get away without copying anything as you go back and forth. Uh, if that's important to you. Um, however, it is still kind of complex, um, most specifically that you have to worry about the semantics of two different languages on top of each other. Um, and not every developer is an expert at both of those languages. Uh, and you really get not, not two classes of bugs, but three, because you've got all your favorite bugs from C++ and from Objective-C, and a whole new class where they interact, um, like where Arc automatically captures a strong reference that goes into a Lambda in C++ and ends up creating a nice circular uh, reference loop. Um, that is really hard for any kind of a tool to detect for you. Um, I've experienced this. Um, so what we do based on this is we limit Objective-C++ to the boundary. Uh, we don't use it in the U our UI. Um, your mileage may vary. Maybe you want to use it, and you can. Um, but we try and keep our, let our UI developers focus on what's natural to them um, using the Apple frameworks on iOS. Um, and so even if Objective-C++ is powerful and it's less painful than JNI, you're still writing wrapper functions. Nobody likes writing wrapper functions, and you've got to write a lot of them, and you don't want to get any, miss any details. So I really wish I didn't have to write Objective-C++ again either, at least for this purpose. There are other things it's cool for. Um, fortunately, I have two wishes left, so I'll use wish number two um, and use my same interface for Objective-C as well. Um, so let me talk you, to you a little bit about the genie who's been granting my wishes here. Um, this is a tool that we've developed at Dropbox. Um, it's pronounced genie. Um, this is just an alternative transliteration of the same word. Um, very loosely derived from Dropbox JNI, uh, back when it was only a generator for JNI. Um, that's the best pronounceable word we could get out of it. And we think it's kind of cool that it starts with a D for Dropbox. Um, so what genie does is it generates bridge code between languages. Uh, so that you don't have to write it yourself, all of that boilerplate stuff that I just showed you. And it currently supports uh, Java bridging to C++ and Objective-C bridging to C++ through the layers that I've mentioned to you. Um, so what does it do? Uh, you define an interface using a custom IDL. I'll show you a more detailed example of that in, the, in a moment. Um, Genie will generate the bridge code for you, uh, so you don't have to write it. Um, it creates a proxy class in Java and all the JNI marshalling that goes with it. It creates an Objective-C interface and the Objective-C++ marshalling, marshalling goes with it. And in, in this case, it would create an abstract base class in C++, and your job is to create a concrete implementation of that abstract base class. Um, there is a corresponding uh, case for calling from C++ into Java or Objective-C. That works too. They'd be getting slightly different output, but it all still works, and you would be responsible for implementing on the other side. Um, what does the IDL support? Um, it has interfaces. Um, these are, contain methods, but no instance data. They're like that abstract base, base class, a protocol in Objective-C or an interface in Java. Um, they can be implemented in both ways, as I mentioned. Um, it supports records for pure data types that you want to pass back and forth. Um, they can contain various primitive types or other records um, by value. So this is not actually for, for building your, your uh, graph structures. You can do that with interfaces if you want to. 
Um, and it supports enumeration, so you don't have to define constants across three different languages, which, oh my god, was a, a pain before we had this. Um, the primitive types that Genie supports are uh, intentionally an intersection of what all of these languages can support. So for instance, uh, there is no uh, unsigned integer type uh, because Java doesn't do that. That doesn't mean we don't use size t in our C++ code where you're supposed to. We do that, but we just it doesn't cross the boundary because Java can't understand it. Um, we also support, support the kind of types you'd want, strings, binaries, list set and map types, um, which map to an appropriate uh, native type on, in each language. Um, for C++ programmers, this list maps to a vector in C++, not a standard list, which is a linked list. Um, we just think that matches people's expectations and what they really want most of the time. Um, and then we've got this type called optional. Um, all the other types here I mentioned are by value. If you know C++, um, they, they are not nullable. Um, if you want something passed through that is nullable, then you use an optional. And in Java, that's just represented by a null and a nil in Objective C++ or in Objective C. Um, in C++, you'd actually get a type called optional, um, which is in a proposed standard. It's not actually in, uh, didn't make it into C++ 14, but we've used a uh, open source implementation that works just just fine. Um, Genie also does other things. It's got static methods, which are particularly useful for the factories that create the concrete Im implementation of the various interfaces. Somebody's got to start that process at the beginning, and after that, it can just be methods generating new objects. Um, it has constants, not just enums. Uh, it'll auto-generate things like comparisons for you in, whatever, in every language, um, or you can configurably tell it to let your records have room for you to implement your own methods on them if you want to. Um, one of my favorite features, the documentation comments that you put in the IDL file will make it into the output. Um, so people use in their IDEs will be able to see that displayed automatically um, if that's something that their IDE supports. Um, and it also has configurable naming conventions for every language because so we wanted the code as much as possible to look native in every language, not go through something that looks awkward like it's a, an RPC boundary. So here's a slightly more detailed example of uh, what a Genie IDL might look like. Um, I've got an enum with three values. Um, I've got a record, which is pure data, contains an enum and a string. And this deriving statement says, I want you to auto-generate comparisons for equality and for ordering. Um, and then you can say, I want an interface, again, implemented in C++, but the, this could be a plus O or a plus J if I want it to be implemented on other sides. It could, it could be several of those. Um, this one has a constant, um, has a couple methods, uh, and it has a static method, which I can, I can use as a factory to generate objects of this interface. So the only thing you might not be used to here is that we're putting types on the right. Um, that's a place where C++ is starting to lean towards as well, um, and we think it's a little bit, a little bit clearer. Um, but once you get used to that, this is pretty uh, easy and obvious to read. Um, how are we for time? It looks like we've still got some, so um, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of a tour of some of the generated code, just so you can see what that looks like. Um, the, uh, I asked my friend Tony, who works on Carousel, to give me a slightly more real example. So here's a very simplified view, view of what something might work like in Carousel. Um, you have a photo, which is a record. Um, it contains an ID and a file name. Um, and you're gonna have this photo model, which is an interface, and lets you get photos. Obviously, Carousel does slightly more than this, but this is good enough for now. Um, so here's what the Java code looks like. If you're an Android developer, this is what you'd be interacting with. Um, here's your class photo, um, which is the data type. It's pretty, pretty standard, has you know, accessors. Um, it's all immutable, records are uh, by default. Um, and the one interesting bit is this annotation here. Um, you can configure what annotation this should be in terms of what uh, class and package if you're uh, configuring the tool. But we need that because we run ProGuard, and ProGuard strips out unused code, which is great. Um, but it doesn't know about JNI, so it's going to assume that this thing is unused if the only place it's ever used is in JNI. Um, so we use this annotation to write a little ProGuard rule to avoid that. Um, keep that in mind if you ever try this out. Uh, so here's what your photo model class looks like. This is the, the interface. Um, and then the uh, method declaration is really simple. This is actually all I would have had to show you because this is all you would interact with if you're a Java developer. Um, it looks pretty simple, returns an array list. That's something you're used to dealing with. Um, but uh, here's a little bit of a peek under the covers at the beginning of, this is the stub that Genie generated um, that holds on to the reference to the native C++ object, um, knows how to destroy it. And here you'd see some other methods that um, do the native implementation. I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Um, so let's look at the Objective-C side. If you're an iOS developer, here's what you would see. Um, this is a very standard, uh, you know, pure data 
interface. It's got two properties. They're read-only, kind of what you would expect. Um, and then here's the photo model. It turns into a protocol um, because it's only specifying methods. There's no data here. Um, and then Genie would generate a concrete class that implements it and uh, all of the marshaling logic that's behind there. Um, and then finally, the C++ layer, which is where, you're, where you are if you're uh, writing your libraries, um, creates a struct for the photo. Um, two elements, has a constructor. Nothing particularly exciting, um, though if you haven't seen C++11 before, that standard move is, an, is a nice trick that lets you uh, move objects rather than copying them, um, which avoids extra copies along the way. Um, that's something that the language now exposes to you so you can control your performance if you want to. Uh, and then here's the photo model. This is an abstract base class. Um, and this is the method, and that equals zero annotation is what says this is pure abstract. There's no implementation. Um, so some concrete type is going to have to subclass this in order to provide the implementation. Um, Genie will generate a bunch of other stuff I didn't show you. Um, in C++, I actually showed you everything, because this, uh, this was a class that was meant to be implemented in C++. You're the one who provides the concrete base class or uh, subclass. Um, in Java, you see the implementation of that native proxy, um, and then all this JNI stuff, which is C++ code. Um, and in Objective-C, you'd see these other files that uh, contain the Objective-C++ code. Um, you might remember I have one wish left, and if you like your genie, um, this is what you're supposed to do with your third wish. Um, so genie, I wish you were free, um, and he is. So you all can try this out. Uh, go to our GitHub. Um, Genie is available under Apache 2.0 licenses, contains a sample app that builds a cross-platform on Android and iOS. Um, we actually use Google's uh, cross-platform build tool from Chromium called GIP, so you'll see an example of that as well. I haven't talked about that, but it's a little bit, it's kind of cool too. Um, Genie is in beta. That doesn't mean that we think it's broken. We're actually shipping product on it, but we've obviously only tested it on our, our use cases, so let us know if it works for your use case. and. Uh, we, we, we might be able to help you fix it, or maybe you can help us fix, this, fix, fix it and send a uh, pull request. Um, so that's all the technical detail, deep dives I got for you. I'm going to do a very quick uh, conclusion before I run out of time. Um, so as you saw in the, in the keynote today uh, and the earlier talks, multi-platform is a reality. You should be planning for at least iOS and Android. You might also want to be planning for portability to desktop of your apps. You might want to be planning for Windows Phone or BlackBerry if you want to be really comprehensive. Um, the way that we've been doing this has worked pretty well for us, um, allowed us to minim minimize duplication in our code, link together a native UI with shared logic so that we get the best of both worlds, fast UI that looks native while all of our shared code gets writ written only once and is highly performant. Um, C++ 11 and 14 is up to the challenge for being a uh, application development language. Alex gave you a little bit of a view of that. There's a lot more, lots more that you can learn. But our app developers have been relatively happy switching to C++. Um, there's some learning curve, obviously, but it's not nearly as daunting as it used to be for someone who's used to something like Java. Um, and hopefully what I showed you today is a, uh, a place to start. Um, and Genie will give you a starting point for generating this glue code. Um, our goal on the um, cross-platform library team at Dropbox is to give as close to zero cost for developing cross-platform rather than developing on one platform. Uh, and this kind of tooling and methodology is a big part of how we're doing that. That's it. Uh, if you want to look up more information online, uh, feel free. Uh, we've, these slides will be up. Um, Genie is available on uh, GitHub. And uh, you can email us if you have any questions. Um, and of course, oblig obligatory shameless plug, we'd like you to come help us do this, whether it's by sending us pull requests or joining us at Dropbox. Um, so I'm done. Do I have a couple minutes for questions? Otherwise, we'll stick around uh, as lunch gets started, and uh, feel free to come uh, talk to us. Anyone have questions? Questions? What does your repo management look like? Is everything in the same repo? Do you do some kind of dependencies, or what does that look like? Uh, that's something that's in the, in the process of changing. Um, we used to have a bunch of separate repos. Carousel, for instance, was originally split to an iOS repo, an Android repo, and then a, a shared repo. Um, turned out that was a huge headache. 
meant that if you wanted to make a change that touched the library layer and changed the interface, you had to touch three repos. Keeping that in sync is really hard. Um, so we've actually relatively recently merged everything into one. We think that's our way going forward. We think that we can deal with the scaling plot, uh, problems of the source control when we get to it. Having everything in one repo lets us do things like refactor across boundaries um, and keep everything very flexible. But we're not all the way there yet. Mailbox still has a couple separate repos, and we're getting there. Yes? Uh, hi. So I just wanted to know how, uh, I mean, I just want your opinion, how Node.js can play in this cross-platform role. Like, like you can have uh, some services or, say, mid-tier or frontier services written in Node, and then iOS and Android apps can call that, call those endpoints, and, like, I mean, your brain of your app can live in Node.js and something like that. So I just want okay, to. So the, the question was uh, how Node.js uh, would fit into this. And I think you're asking about running Node on the server, not trying to run it on a mobile device, right? Yeah. OK. Um, so that would be very natural for anybody's app. If your back end is written in Node, like you can talk to it through, uh, through this framework just fine. Um, in our case, um, our apps are, cannot be only a thin wrapper around a server backend because we want to support offline. We want to let you have your documents um, even when you go into a tunnel or on an airplane. Um, so that's why we have this slightly complicated syncing logic, and there's a benefit to writing that once across platform. Um, there actually is a large class of apps that maybe g would get less benefit from this architecture because they really are just direct front ends to a service on the server, and the code for talking to that service is pretty simple. If your app is in that category, you might just want to write it twice on each platform because the duplicated effort is very small. Um, though, I mean, we've gotten a lot of benefit from moving our view models into C++, as Alex said, so maybe you'd get benefit there as well. But I don't think there's anything about this architecture that would keep you from using that. Yes, hi. Um, Genie looks great. I can't wait to try it. But um, did your team experiment with Swig at all before getting to GD? We did, and I had a slide in here um, talking about the trade-offs that I pulled out because I thought we were going to be short on time. Um, but uh, so the basic version of that uh, is we did look at things like Swig, which would extract the, uh, the interface directly out of the C++ code. We looked at some other code generation possibilities. Nothing really fit. Um, one thing we like about having an IDL is that it gives a very clear interface boundary. Um, you don't get things accidentally leaking, like this C++ class had a public method that was meant for the unit test to call or something. Um, we can define our data types to be very clear and marshallable and be that intersection across languages. Um, and another thing we like about this is that it's actually language agnostic on all sides. I've talked about linking to C++ as a back end, but there's no reason we couldn't also link to a different language if we prefer that. Um, or we've talked about using uh, Genie to just generate serialization code from the records so that you could serialize them into a database or across the, across the wire as JSON or protobufs or whatever. Um, so those are kind of the high order bit of, of why we like this approach. Question over there? When organizers tell me when I should stop, I'm going to keep answering questions <laughs> until you do. Last okay. You mentioned two different approaches uh, to use native, like two platform networking, and use one if library. Which one do you like think will be your choice? Um, we're we're leaning towards most of our apps using the platform service approach, where you can actually leverage the platform features. Um, an example, a key example there is on iOS. We do want to leverage background fetch for things like camera upload. You can't do that if you're operating purely in C++. Um, so given that there's always going to be some platform-specific features, we think we'd like to leverage um, as much as we can. But that is an app-specific choice. That, like, we have nice wrappers now using this platform service to call the Dropbox APIs. Um, Mailbox is doing their own thing because they want lower-level socket access. And I don't think there's any reason to force them to change. But uh, if, a new, if an app developer comes to me saying, like, I'm gonna, I want to talk to this new API or I'm building a new app, I'm going to recommend that they go the platform service route and use the stuff we've built. Um, and they can make their own decision if they want to do something different. All right, that's all the time we have. But Alex and I will stick around if you have any other questions. Um, otherwise, enjoy your lunch. Thank you.